Welcome to season two of the Get Out of Teaching podcast presented by Larksong Enterprises. I'm your host, Elizabeth Diakos. On the show, we'll look at the who, what, where, why, when, and how of moving out of your education career and into a life you love. In this season, we'll meet ex-teachers who have taken their hobbies and passions from outside of education and created a new career for themselves. We'll talk to people who can support and inspire us as we make the transition and work on identifying the legacy we want to leave in the world. So come along for the ride as we get out of teaching. Many teachers from the Get Out of Teaching Facebook group tell me that the main reason they're still teaching when they'd rather leave is financial security. So next week, my guest will be show sponsor Chris Carlin, financial planner and mortgage broker from Master Your Money Now. Our conversation will focus on income protection and Chris has some really helpful insights for teachers who may be out on sick leave or stress leave, as well as some pearls of wisdom for early career teachers. With over nine years experience in the finance sector, Aussies from all around the country have trusted Chris to help plan their financial futures. Chris Carlin cares for the caring professions, teachers and nurses, helping you to shore up your financial resources so that you'll be in a good position to leave when you're ready. If you're concerned about your financial future, go to masteryourmoneynow.com.au to book a free 30 minute chat with Chris Carlin and master your money now. Hi everyone and welcome to the show. On today's show, I'm very pleased to uh, be interviewing Suzanne Gervais. Thanks for coming on the show, Suzanne. A pleasure to be here. And so tell us your story. What got you into teaching in the first place? Well, it's called a scholarship. Um, (laughs) I was actually um, on my way to Perth with an arts degree and we stopped off in Melbourne just for a little bit and I saw an application for a dip ed and I thought, oh, I'll apply for it. They'll pay you a whole year's salary to do two days teaching, three days studying. I applied and that's why I became a teacher. Oh, wow. And when was that? And where were you coming from on your way to Perth? Well, I was coming from Sydney. I was um, newly married and we were on our great Australian adventure and just uh, stopped in in Melbourne because my husband was doing some temporary work there as an engineer, saw the advertisement, Mm -hmm. applied. And when I got it, imagine I got a whole year's salary for studying. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And so did you have to stay in Melbourne then? Uh, No. What happened is uh, I did my two days a week teaching. And when I finished with my diploma, I was free to go anywhere. It was, I don't know, it was one of those strange, Mm. odd scholarships that just came into the ether. And and so how long ago was that? Oh, gosh, 20 years ago. Okay. A bit of a time ago. Yeah, yeah, a fair while ago, but still not that distant to no. have such an amazing scholarship. That sounds like something out of the 1930s, doesn't it? <laughs> but it wasn't. <laughs> okay. All right. No, no not wanting to uh, imply that at all. So, um, Suzanne, tell us what, what was the context when you were teaching for that first year? How long were you, like, where were you? What, what did you do? So what was the beginning like? Okay, it was um, Moorabbin uh, Technical College. I was all of um, 20 and it was my first experience. And let me put it this way. It was a very unusual experience. My first entree to the school was a big boy. He looked about 15 or 16, tall kid. He comes up to me. And he puts out his hand and he has a screw in it. And he said, Miss, would you like a screw? And I thought, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh, I might have trouble. And my first year was very confronting. 
and um, I did come out to two types oh, no. and the hives lot in that first year and I'm sort of grateful for it sort of <laughs> what tell me what oh hang on a second I got I got hives in my first year. I didn't know what happened to me. I went to the GP and he said, what do you do? And I said, first year teaching. He said, well, that's the reason. Oh, you know, it, it was very confronting. But the thing is, I learned a lot. I learned how to deal with young people. I learned how to cry a bit. Mm. And in the end, I decided it was either you or me, and I won. <laughs> no. so, so it sounds like it was a bit of a battleground. First year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so then you were a newlywed and you were working in this fairly stressful environment. Um, and then what happened at the end of that year? At the end of that year, I came back to Sydney, which is where I'm from, and I began my teaching career. And again, it was very confronting. I was now 21 and I, I was teaching all the way up to year 12, kids who are up to 18. Mm. And I had to teach the advanced level. You can imagine, I was literally one step ahead of the kids so every night i was working day and night so that i looked smarter than them so what what were you actually teaching english and modern history okay. and it was look i loved it i loved the subjects but it was the first time i dealt with that curriculum mm. and you know i had to teach at such a high level year 10 11 12 the seniors and they knew so much more than me <laughs> yeah. oh nice okay and so um you did you stay in that school the whole time that when you were up in sydney i stayed in the one school and i learned to love it and be exhausted by it and what i found is it became my life so that I was, I didn't have much more outside my teaching life, of course, other than my, you know, marriage and family, mm. because teaching so all consuming, it takes all of you. So I was there and I also taught at our technical colleges at night. And it was again, interesting. I taught all these plumbers and tradespeople, kids, how to communicate and write mm. and it was a bit of fun i must say so i did a bit of that and i also taught at the university some um advanced courses in creative writing and that was really wonderful so mm. did you need to go and get some additional qualifications to do that like a certificate for or something else on top of your teaching qualification i got a master of education and I've got a Master of Arts. So I did have additional qualifications which helped me get those positions. And they were part-time positions. Hmm. I still worked as a teacher in a school. So you were working all day and then going and doing another job at night? Yes, it's called paying off your mortgage. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Still pretty stressful environment to be like both of those things together. That's a lot. It was tiring, but um, I got better at it and, you know, more uh, skilled in organising my time sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And so when, when you did finally decide to leave education, what was the tipping point for you? Well, there were two things. One is that I did want to be a writer and whatever the place of being a writer is, is the place of teaching. It is a deep emotional place. And I just could not write or create after teaching because I was drained. So I had to decide, did I want to do that for my life? 
And then the second thing is I had kids and they were also that same place of writing and teaching just takes every ounce from you. And it's neither good nor bad, but it means there's no space for other things. So how old were your children when you decided to leave? Oh, they were babies. They were oh, babies. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so you were just finding it hard to juggle all of those commitments? Yes. And also to pursue my creative life, which I had just begun doing. Mm, okay. On the side. Mm. So was there fear around that for you? Like you just said you were doing two jobs or three jobs to pay off the mortgage and now you're thinking about stepping out of that entirely. Well, not entirely. One of the great things about teaching is it gives you so many skills that you can use outside teaching. So I could still work part-time at the tape. I could still coach if I wanted for additional money. Mm. But uh, becoming a writer was an extremely hard journey, but one that I am really glad I jumped into, but it was very hard. Yeah, okay. So um, just just going back to the, uh, the idea of uh, TAFE, just explain what that is for our international listeners. Oh, okay. TAFE is a post-school technical type college where you get kids who are from, well, not kids, teenagers are from 18 up to grandparents of 75. And it's a mixed, uh, I guess, a mixed uh, trade type course. So you can do uh, subjects such as improving your communication if you're doing a trade, or you can do your final exams by studying as a mature age student. You can do art, you can do a whole variety of um, courses there. And you can also study there as a interlude between school and further tertiary education. So I taught there and it was really interesting, just the people I met, you know, who've come back, especially women coming back to retrain for the workforce. I love that. Yeah, fantastic. So you you got this lovely broad experience of really all the age levels, as it turned out. So when you were, um, as you stepped out of that that you know sort of full on full time teaching role, what? How did you do that? Like, what did you start doing as an alternative? Because you still well, have a young family. Yes, I had a young family. So what I did is, as I mentioned, I did uh, do this part-time teaching and coaching, you know, on the side, I did start writing and writing is, and I wanted to be in the children's space because um, children's writing is everyone from preschool up to the end of high school. So it's a very broad range and you have enormous impact. And so I began by, um, joining classes at TAFE for this technical college. They also had these creative writing classes, which were very economical. And I also began to get into the community of children's writing. If you don't get into the community, you have no chance because the community embraces you, like the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators or the Children's Book Council or the writing centres. If you don't join in there, you won't get the support you need to pursue your goals. You can't do it alone. That sounds like some really helpful advice for anyone who's considering going down that pathway. Yeah, I mean, it also is where you get the hints of what to do and people become your friends. My best friends in the world are writers and illustrators. We help each other all the time. Oh, there's an opportunity or there, come and join us. Yeah. Great, great. And it looks just in your background there, you've got uh, on your virtual background, you've got some pictures of some of your books and I can yeah. see it looks like you've worked with the same illustrator on a few projects. 
when you look there's so much to learn when you leave teaching in the sense that you think oh i can just be a writer or whatever creator you want to be mm. it's a different industry you have to do the work so um something as simple as that i am jack series uh it's illustrated by Kathy Wilcox, who's a political cartoonist for The Age, The Herald. Oh, yes. Now, I don't pick that. That is something the publishers will select and negotiate. So if I went and selected an illustrator, they would consider me unprofessional. So you've got to know the ropes, really. That's funny. I, I, just, I, I did actually know that, but I didn't realise what a big deal it was. I just find that astounding because if you like an illustrator and they understand your vision as a writer, surely that's a good collaboration. Well, the publishers regard the relationship between an illustrator and an author as potentially dangerous because if the author is difficult or doesn't like whatever happens, there can be arguments they think. But I'm an experienced author now. I've been doing it for 20 years and I have a little bit of what we call clout. So with my new book, actually here it is, I'll just show you to get the concept. Oh, I wonder if you can see it. There's a little boy. Yeah. There. It's boy in the big blue glasses. Because I have a little clout, I submitted it to the publisher. They accepted it. And then I said, oh, I have one condition. What? <laughs> I want this illustrator. I love her. And they were very unhappy about that. But I said, please call her. And we made the agreement. But that's very rare. Right. Okay. Good on you for sticking to your guns. Okay. So what would you say uh, you came out of education with in terms of transferable skills? Obviously, you've got some negotiation skills. Yes. Of which, look, teaching is the most wonderful grounding in any future profession. Firstly, to go and confront a group of kids is extremely brave and confronting. A lot of people think, oh, you know, I work in an office with all these adults. Forget it. Kids take no, they take no survivors. You go out there and you've got to perform. You've got to um, reach them, educate them. So that is very confronting. And I think a teacher who learns those skills are skills for life and for any future job. That's the first thing. Teaching also teaches you to program. You can be creative in the classroom and i hope i was but there is a lot of programming that not only compliance but just in to ensure you fulfill the curriculum requirements and it's hard and you have to learn it you become very good at computer skills no choice because you know you have to transfer the um results and the programs and all those sort of things into computable, computer accessible files and to share. You learn collaboration. As a high school teacher, I had to work within a team with my English team or my history team. And we had to collaborate in terms of ensuring we're doing similar programs, getting results that are appropriate and sometimes team sharing which I loved because it meant half the work in preparing work and then giving me extra time to do that but more than that teaching enabled me to do what brings me my income as a children's author my books are in a lot of bookshops and schools and that's great and that's my entree to what I really do for a profession. I'm a speaker. I speak at schools, they pay me. I speak at festivals, conferences. On top of that, I can have a bit of fun. I was invited to go to Istanbul. They paid for me to speak at the Istanbul Literature Festival because my books had been translated into Turkish. So the fact that 
I'm an experienced speaker, which is bringing my income. That came from teaching. I'm not afraid of addressing 10 kids or a thousand kids, mm. adult kids. I'm not afraid. So it sounds like actually your writing is almost the, uh, the, uh, the conduit that yes. allows you to be a speaker. Yep. Yep. If I don't have books out, believe me, the advances are very poor. I am not J.K. Rowling. I wish. <laughs> yeah, we all wish. The thing is, my the advances are quite small and you do have to do quite a lot of media and promotion. It's really to try and sell the books. But in reality, it is the fact that my books especially go into schools. I mean, schools, libraries, school librarians, English teachers, they're my gods. Without them, honestly, I'd have no career. And one of the great things is because I was a teacher, I know these people, I know how they operate. I know their digital connections and you know, I've got friends there as well, and it enables me to um, sell books, but more importantly, to get into the schools. And when I get into the schools, of course, I talk about my work, but I'm able to integrate my novels and my writing into their programs so they can tick those boxes while still having a great time. Sounds like a great skill you've developed there. So, uh, Suzanne, what extra training or study did you need to do? Like you said, you did your Master of Arts, but was there anything else that you needed to do to get to where you are now? Well, I think teaching is the best training. I can't, it puts you in every single possible area of conflict and joy. It just does. You end up you know, teaching whole groups of kids to debate or you end up uh, on camps, you end up here and there. Teaching is an amazing, amazing preparation for your future career. For training, I did a Master of Education, which for me is super helpful because my books are heavily, heavily grounded in social justice, that's why I write. And having my Master of Education with a specialisation in um, child growth and development, my books are enriched with, I call it correct, accepted, wise um, educational psychology. So I found that incredibly enriching for my writing practice. And the second master's I did was because I was so nervous about deciding to be a writer. I thought, I can't do it. I'm hopeless. How will I get there? And then I applied for a master of creative writing at UTS to try and give me the confidence uh, to go into this new career because it was pretty scary. And so that's what I did. But I believe um, if you want ed extra training, you have to belong to a Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators who have hundreds and hundreds of amazing um, uh, Zoom craft sessions, uh, introduction to the publishers, now with Zoom, because of COVID, COVID um, it's become so enriched. But once COVID goes, there's also the meetings where you meet publishers, meet other authors mm. and, I, and illustrators. And I promise you, that is the best training. So you're, are you saying then, let me get this clear, that you don't actually need to go and do further formal academic study that you could get everything that you needed from those more informal short courses yes and you know depending on what you pick um you'll find that as i said with scbwi the 
the courses. What is that? Oh, Society, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Yeah. That is like open because it's an international organization with 80, 80 chapters from the US to Malaysia to UK to Australia to everywhere. Mm. They have um, webinars and courses across the globe. And with the Zooms, they're cheap, mm. really. And a lot of them free once you belong. It's pretty good. But if you um, wanted to do screenwriting, join the Australian Writers Guild. If you want to do adult, join the Australian Society of Authors. These industry organisations run the type of material you need mm. to get your profession up and running and get the craft Fantastic. and the confidence. Yeah. Wonderful advice there. Thank you for that. I'm sure that uh, I know many of my listeners are, for this podcast are interested in becoming writers. So that's really helpful. Thank you. So if, if someone was feeling stuck and they were hesitating to leave because of all the reasons you described earlier about that security and that, that really um, knowing what you're doing every day, that, that, not just security financially, but in terms of the role itself, what advice would you give someone who felt that way? Well, to feel that way means you're normal. Yeah. I believe. <laughs> um, I believe in preparation. So when you make that transition, don't leave yourself high and dry, please. Like, as I said, I ensured that I had my part-time work with TAFE. Or it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a TAFE. It could be, I don't know, working at a um, play group if you wanted to do younger. Or doing whatever you like. But to ensure, one, you have some sort of regularity within your week. And two, some income. You need both. But you will have to accept your income will drop. Hmm. And so and that's tough. Yeah. And, and have you uh, been able to replace your teaching income now? Or has that not, is that not as important anymore? Like how did you, you don't have to tell us numbers, but just, a, you know, an idea. Okay. I'm actually quite successful in my area. Uh, my book sell and thank God for librarians. Thank you, librarians um, and schools. So the way I make my money is through something called educational lending rights and public lending rights. In Australia, we have a wonderful system where the government funds books in libraries, school libraries and public libraries. And they do a survey every three years and you put in your books to the government, educational lending rights, public lending rights, put your books in. And once a year, they pay you for borrowing rights because when you put your books in the library, that book will not be sold. So it's a Australian system and it is it sustains authors. So the amount the amount of money you get will be dependent on the number of books you write and how they have penetrated the schools and libraries. As a children's author, our money comes mainly from educational lending rights from teachers and librarians who put it in their schools. The money you get depending on how many books, is up to 60000 a year. I don't get 60000 a year. <laughs> so I had no yeah. idea. So are you saying school librarians have to submit something? How do they no, know? No. How they do they don't know? submit. No, how no. How do they know how, who, who bought your books? Okay. The way it works is the government has some computer program and the books are logged in to each school library. So through the computer system and the analogs, whatever they do, they work out how many of your books are in a certain area. Then they allocate a 
50 cents per book or whatever. So it works out. I am not good at that type of thing, forget it. But it means that if you're a writer with a body of work, you will get from the Australian government through their statistical analysis of how many books are in school libraries and public libraries. As a children's author, it's the school libraries that are our lifeblood. So the librarians, school librarians, have got to buy our books and not throw them away. Bad idea. And then we can live. So that's one. Wow. The second way I make my money is through the copyright agency. It's free to belong. But if you're an author, you uh, list your books and what you do there. And they, and even if you don't list it, they'll follow it up and then they'll pay you once a year if people, mainly educational institutions, are copying your work. So, for example, you know, I just got, say, $2,000 because some, I don't know, magazine copied some articles I wrote. So it's that second, that helps as well. And then you have to do speaking engagements and they bring your income. At the moment, authors and illustrators are in trouble because there are no school visits with COVID. Right, got it. But surely it also opens up possibilities for you to go into schools virtually. And I mean, teachers are still wanting to talk to authors, surely. Yep. And I've been into schools virtually. The problem is because um, there's so much on the uh, internet, mm. it's, they're not tending to pay. So it's still something being worked out. And it may end up, we don't know how it's, end up, how it's going to end up. It's a period of flux now. But as I said, ELR, PLR, Cal sustains us. Plus, we do get some advances for our book. Mm. I've got a new book coming out next year in April because it was delayed a year because of COVID. Okay. But when it comes out, I'll get more money, my yeah. advance. And also, yeah. presumably, when people start borrowing it for the libraries or buying it to put in the libraries, you'll also get that, that payment as well. Yeah, that's really important. Wow. And the other thing is... As a writer, you don't have to just be a writer for um, books. You know, I write articles and, you know, I engage in that aspect, like a journalist type, uh, type role. And um, I do that. Also, a lot of authors do workshops, uh, depending on, you know, their skill set, because um, creative workshops have a huge demand, both from parents and schools. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for explaining all that. It's a really complex sort of behind the scenes picture of the, that, that, that part of the world that I really didn't know very much about at all. Thank you. So um, Suzanne, if, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, maybe to book you to come and speak at a school, either virtually or in person, um, or to buy some of your books, what would be the best way forward for that? They can go to my website, which is a really easy website since it's my name it's www dot then the rest s for suzanne gervay g-e-r-v-a-y dot com but if you google my name um just google it you'll find me because by a sheer miracle my parents have a name that no one else has other than my siblings. Mm. So when you Google me, I'm you gonna come up. up. <laughs> my name is not Gay Smith. It okay. is Suzanne Gervais, an unusual name by a miracle. Fantastic, all right. And so um, before, I, I just wanna ask you, you, you know, when you left teaching into this field that you're in now, there were obviously a few little hiccups along the way as you got established. Any regrets? Yes and no. No, re the regrets are when I get rejected, 
then I am very sad and depressed. But overall, it is the life I want. It's a passionate life. I travel, meet kids, well, when we could travel all over the world, from Delhi to New York. Um, it's an opportunity to advocate the causes that matter to me, which are literacy, um, anti-bullying. So I am glad I did this, but it's not easy. You have to want to. Mm, not for the faint-hearted. No, not at all. <laughs> okay, so uh, Suzanne, before we wrap this up, I have a bit of a curly question for you now. Yep. What's the legacy that you want to leave in the world? Well, that's exactly why I write. Look, my parents were post-war refugees and they struggled when they came to Australia. And I knew that I wanted to empower young people that they do not have to be victims. They can reach for their dreams. So my books are all based on that. And when I received the Order of Australia for my work in children's literature and young adult literature, I just felt like I was a hundred feet tall. I was so deeply moved because it sort of made my parents' journey really valid. Like you come to a country here and you live your life trying to empower young people. And I received the um, Lifetime Social Justice Award for my body of work um, by the International Literacy Association. And look, that makes me happy. And I know that kids who read my books, yes, they must be entertaining. They are literacy. They're all about literacy and literature. But ultimately, I seek to travel with young people in their development of values so that they don't get lost on that rocky road called life. So that's my legacy, I think. Suzanne Gervais, thank you so much for coming on the Get Out of Teaching podcast today. My pleasure. It's a wonderful legacy to leave in the world. Thank you. You've been listening to the Get Out of Teaching podcast presented by Larksong Enterprises with your host, Elizabeth Diakos. Do you know someone else who could benefit from hearing more stories of hope and transition from teachers all around the world? Please take a moment to share this and other episodes via your podcast app. Each share helps me reach listeners just like you who can benefit from this content. The Get Out of Teaching podcast is proud to be part of the Experts on Air podcast network. For show notes and other resources, please visit larksong.com.au forward slash podcast.